Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is the English Standard Version of the Bible. Um, if you don't have a Bible, there's plenty of pew Bibles in front of you. Um, so let's, let's make sure we read it together. After I read these two verses, I'll say this is God's Word. If you agree that this is God's Word, would you say together, Thanks be to God. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by the testing, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is God's Word. You may be seated. We are a church that is transformed by the gospel, lives by faith, and is known by our love. We strive to worship the living God, treasure Jesus Christ, and serve in the power of the Spirit. His Word is our delight and our foundation. We aim to be a voice of truth and hope for our community, to seek out the lost for salvation, and disciple all believers into maturity in Christ for the glory of God alone. This is our mission statement, right? You've heard that hopefully a couple of times. Uh, each year since I've been here, I like to take the month of October to look intentionally at why we exist and what we're doing about it. Uh, we like to preach through books of the Bible. FYI, going through the book of Acts, we'll come back to that. We want God's Word to speak to us verse by verse, so we're not picking and choosing a bunch of stuff. Uh, and actually, I won't be picking and choosing a bunch of stuff this month anyways. Uh, but we're coming back to Acts, uh, probably October 30th. Um, but you hear it every Sunday, transforming hearts, treasuring Christ, teaching truth. We sat down in our replant meetings and we worked through this mission statement together and it served to unify us around the scripture and to ask what Jesus calls his church to look like. What is he building among his people that he created? That was two years ago that we developed that. So how are we doing two years later? Well, Marianne and I went to small group Friday at the Green Home, and Jody had an appropriate assessment, I think, of how uh, this last year has gone. Uh, I believe 2022, is what she said, and I agree with her, that it's felt like a honeymoon. It's felt like a honeymoon. We replanted in 2021. We've gained several new members. We've all been getting to know each other, studying scripture together, living life together. And it's been fun. It's, it's been a joy the last year. Um, I, one of my favorite years, if I can say that, as a pastor. It's just been, it's been awesome. It's been really, really sweet. Um, and some of that is just because of the newness of things has that effect on us. But I think it's primarily because of our shared commitments. We are committed to transformation. We want to keep growing and keep transforming, being sanctified by the word and living out the gospel. We are committed to treasuring Christ, to preaching Jesus and worshiping him in every facet of our lives, adoring him and his cross Loving Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are committed to teaching the truth. Recognizing that God's Word is our foundation and our delight. And it's only by the hearing of the Word of God that He gives faith to sinners who are dead in their sins and are lost and wakes them up to His power and His beauty. His truth does that. And finally, we're also committed to God's glory. The church is not about us. It's not about the people in the pews. It's not about the stuff we do. It's about the God who created us for His glory, saved us for His glory, and now calls us to live in community for His glory. We're for His glory. 
It's these shared values that have made this last year joyful and exciting and gives us much optimism for the future of our church. But after the honeymoon comes what? Comes real life, right? Who is this person that I married? When things get hard, we find out, right, who we truly are. And I'm going to be honest, right? I know I'm supposed to be like your fearless leader, and I'm supposed to know all the answers and just guide us into the future and have everything figured out. But I'm just feeling super duper weak these days, as in I don't know what's going to happen next. (laughs) Right? I was doing the revitalization game for five years and feel like I almost got a hold on that. Now this is a whole new ball game. We're starting with, I, I believe, the healthiest foundation I've seen since 2015. And what we build on that now is what's going to make all the difference for the future. We, we don't want to build wood, hay, and straw, these things that burn up and perish, but things that last and outlive us that are imperishable like gold and silver, right? That's the phase that we're in now. And I don't want to be the cause of stunted growth or building with poor materials that cause this institution to collapse. This is very real for me as it is very real for you. What's going to help me pastor you into the next five years? What's going to keep you tethered to the right mindset and joyful stewardship in this church for the next five years? Transforming hearts, treasuring Christ, and teaching truth for the glory of God alone. I actually believe that these core values values will stem all kinds of fruitful and lasting ministries, if only the Lord will build the house. So first up on the list today, transforming hearts. Transforming hearts. And boy, have I got a text for you. Romans chapter 12. Romans is Paul's systematic theology, it's been called. But more than that, he wasn't out to just write a systematic theology. He was writing to a church that he loved well, to people in Rome that were a mixed bag of Gentiles and Jews. Um, And then more than a letter or a systematic theology, it's Bible. It's God's Word, right? Breathed out to correct and train and reprove us. It's the Bible. And and, and Paul sees these people and he, he seeks largely to explain what kind of people the cross has created. There were Gentiles and Jews squabbling over issues of the law and circumcision and ethnicity and ancestry and all of these things. Paul's answer to all of these questions is Jesus. Is anyone good? Nobody except Jesus. Can anyone be saved by works of the law? Of course not. Jesus lived a perfect life on our account. He fulfilled the law for us. Is Father Abraham the one who makes us acceptable before God? No. Jesus is. And guess what? Through Jesus, Gentiles can call Abraham Father too. Are we saved that sin may abound? By no means. Jesus died to make us righteous and to sanctify us. Well, if God is saving Gentiles now, what happens to Israel? They can be saved too, and God would love to save them through the same blood that he's provided for the Gentiles. And all of this sort of crescendos in chapter 11 into a declaration of praise to the sovereign king. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. Who can know his mind? How inscrutable are his ways? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. Enter chapter 12. And I want to start here because this first phrase in chapter 12 calls us back to all this rich Jesus-centered theology that Paul has been teaching for the last 11 chapters. Paul begins in verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers... Paul was all about giving appeals, wasn't he? 
exhortations and charges. I charge you. I urge you. Right? He taught as if all of eternity was hanging on the exhortations that he was giving. And this time it's no different. This is gravely serious what he's about to say. I appeal, I exhort, I admonish, I urge desperately, seriously. And why is he making this appeal? Therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? Because of everything I just wrote, plus chapter 11, because God is just and righteous and holy, Because God has made us just and righteous and holy through the blood of His Son. Because God's grace is greater than sin, greater than the law, and greater than ethnicity. So he says in Romans 5, or I'm sorry, Romans 11, verse 5, grace. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Chapter 11, 5. Chapter 11, 22. He says, note then the kindness and severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in His kindness. Grace. Verse 11, or chapter 11, verse 30. Verse 30. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, So they too now have been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may also now receive a mercy. Some of Israel and Gentiles. For God has consigned all to disobedience. Why? That he may have mercy on all. Grace, grace, mercy. That's chapter 11. And then to him and through him in all things be for him, his glory. Therefore, because of that, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, brothers, Roman citizen, brothers, Hellenistic Jews, Greek speakers, brothers, Gentiles of all nationalities in Rome, brothers, slaves, brothers, barbarians, brothers, Scythians, brothers, for the Jewish man first, but also for the Greek is the gospel, brothers, brothers, brothers. One new man in place of the two. The power of God to save everyone who believes. I appeal to you, my brothers. Paul was Pharisee of Pharisees. A Jew if there ever was a Jew. And he calls all these Gentiles in Rome what? Brothers. Through whom? The grace and mercy of Jesus. He proudly takes up the mantle of apostle for and to the Gentiles. I appeal to you, therefore, because of the grace of the gospel, this therefore, brothers, Jews and Gentiles alike, who are saved by grace and mercy, by the mercies of God. Y'all, we ain't even got into it yet. By the mercies of God. What's the basis for the appeal he's about to make? The why is the grace of the justifier saving those outside of the law by holy blood and a perfect life who kept the law for us. That's grace. That's the why of the appeal. What's the basis now? What's the how of the appeal? What's Paul's credentials to make this appeal? How's this appeal going to be enabled and acted upon? I make this appeal, and I expect you to follow through with it because of the abundant, steadfast, new every morning, bountiful mercies of God. What's the difference between grace and mercy? Grace is the why of the appeal. Mercy is the how of the appeal. Grace is, you know, the Greek word charis, the favor, blessing, undeserved giving of God's goodness to us. Mercy, or another word is literally compassion, is God treating us with tenderness and understanding, overlooking our wrongs because Jesus stands in our place. Grace is the why, mercy is the how. Why? Because grace. How? Because mercy. Let me dig just a little bit deeper on mercy. 1 Peter 1 reiterates something very, very similar here. 1 Peter 1 verse 3, Paul, or Peter introduces his letter 
saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy. What has His mercy done? He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We're born again, saved, converted, regenerated, all the words, right? Made alive, new people, new creations through the resurrection of Jesus according to His great mercy. Christ died for sins once and for all, rose from the dead, and now by His resurrection, He is saving us from spiritual hell and peril for the rest of all eternity. The piercing arrow of God's converting power to the sinner's heart, the tip of the arrow, is mercy. Mercy is the vehicle that sends the gospel to make the sinner's heart come alive according to mercy through the resurrection of the cross, of Jesus from the the cross. I want you to get all this because this is going somewhere, I promise. This is going somewhere. Mercy is the how of Paul's appeal and Paul is about to give a staggering exhortation that you know well. An exhortation that appears unachievable at first glance. And it absolutely is unachievable to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God as spiritual worship, if it were not for the mercies of God. Impossible outside of the mercies of God. Only the gospel of Jesus, which is the piercing arrow of God's mercy made manifest, can enable us to do what Paul is about to ask us to do. Only the gospel makes this request reasonable. It would be absolute folly for me to preach to you for the rest of the month about how to live out the Christian life together under God's word without asking this question first. Are you saved? Are you saved? Has your heart been transformed by the power of the gospel? Has your soul been penetrated by the mercies of God? Kathy gave her testimony at small group Friday. And I'll just repeat one thing that she said. She said she uh, saw another girl at her vacation Bible school when she was a little girl who wasn't acting saved. And she was telling her mother about this, right? And so Kathy's mother said, well, are you saved? Something clicked. She was convicted of her sin like never before. The only thing that she could do was to fling herself upon the mercies of God. And you know what? God saved her by and according to His great mercies through the resurrection. God saved her. He transformed her and is transforming her and made her alive. Is that your testimony? Have you been transformed according to the mercies of God through the resurrection of Jesus? We are a people who don't just believe a set of orthodox truths from an ancient book. That's true, right? We do do that. But that is not all that we are. We are new creations, new people, changed, transformed from one degree of glory to another by the mercies of God. And this is where our core values have to start here because everything else hinges on whether or not God has saved us and transformed us by the resurrection according to mercy. If you don't know the mercy of God, nothing else we're going to read here is going to make any sense at all because it's impossible without the mercies of God. So before we go any further, again, let me ask one more time. Whether you're visiting, you've been a member here for a number of years, 
or you're a missionary that's about to go overseas, everybody in the room hear this question. Are you transformed? Have you been saved by the mercies of God? Look to Jesus. A transaction so quickly was made when he took the sin of our hearts and we took the offer of grace he did proffer and he saved us. Praise his name. If that's not your testimony, if that's missing somewhere, if you just tried to start doing good things and somebody invited you to church and you heard a, a gospel that was in, or a message that was inspiring by some preacher or you prayed a prayer or you knelt down on a cushion, irrelevant! Have you been transformed? Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus today. Be made alive. If you are saved, this is the best starting point because we have to understand that God has saved us. Why? For His glory. For to Him and through Him and for Him. All things, our salvation, His mercy granted to us, His grace granted to us for His glory. Paul says in Romans 9, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part in dealing with this whole mystery with Israel and the Gentiles? He says, by no means. For he says to Moses, what does he say? I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. God saves us according to his mercy, with his mercy, so that from the beginning from the get-go of this new relationship with our creator we know who's in charge the one who gave mercy right he he saved us for his glory <clears throat> drew told me last week to jo to quote john calvin and jonathan edwards more so this was for him <clears throat> every instance is john calvin every instance in which the mercy of god occurs to our remembrance ought to be embraced by us as an occasion of ascribing glory to God. You remember God's mercy, you give God glory. You remember God's mercy, you give God glory. Repeat, 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 repeat. This is the starting point. With an understanding of grace and mercy beautifully intertwined at the cross, which God used to save us with his own sovereignty and his, his will, his mercy, not human will, not our exertion, he created a new people. And He created a new people with new desires. Those mercies now fuel those desires for His glory. The same mercies of the cross that saved us are the same mercies that now enable us for the rest of our days to do whatever God's Word calls us to do. We read the Bible. We can't do any of it aside from the mercies of God that first saved us. And what is the Word of God calling us to do? To present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. And not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed through the renewal of our minds. And that by testing, we might be able to discern what is the will of God, good and acceptable and perfect. I'm not one of the preachers usually that takes one or two verses and camps out there for like a month. This month I am. That's, I'm not really good at that, typically. But I've just been wrecked by Romans 12, 1 and 2. We're not, we're not even touching the beginning of this today. This is what we're doing the rest of the month, is just this. This is what the Puritans used to do, right? They'd take that one or two verses and just wring them dry with every spiritual truth they could find in there. That's what we're doing in October. And they wrote like 20,000 word books and stuff, you know, or like huge works. Um, and I'm just trying to take two verses and study them and and 
show you a few things. And, and as I did, I, I first realized that this was going to be just today's sermon. <laughs> so this is, this is not just, to, this is transforming hearts, treasuring Christ, and teaching truth. This is all three, okay? Just here in Romans, Romans 12. <clears throat> and the second thing um, I found is this, this really is an excellent paradigm for what we're trying to do here at Main Street. Um, you remember how Jesus taught us to love the Lord? Quoting Moses, right? And adding a fourth one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is what Paul is helping us put together in these two verses. Sacrificing our bodies, our physical nature, ourselves, made from dust, turned into glorious vessels of grace and mercy. Renewing our minds, not being conformed to the world, but being, being changed, having new thoughts and new processes and a new worldview. Loving the Lord with our minds. Loving the Lord with our wills, with our souls. Subjecting our will to His will. Discerning what His will is. Testing it. Understanding the will of God. So again, don't get scared, because I'm already 26 minutes in here, and uh, we hadn't even hit verse 1 yet. So uh, we're just going to hit a little bit of verse 1, and then we'll do the rest the rest of the month, right? Next three weeks, two weeks, we'll, we'll figure it out. So finally, what is Paul's appeal? Present your bodies. Present your bodies. Jews, Gentiles, every believer in Rome, hear this appeal, hear this exhortation with seriousness and the eternal value of what's being said. Present your body. And to present something is not overly complicated, right? To present means what it sounds like. To show, to display, to reveal, to appear. Sometimes we might present a sales pitch if we have a product or a re relevant client that could use what we have to sell, we try to convince them of why they need it. We present to them all the reasons why they want to purchase this thing. We can present a dissertation, an academic argument for something, trying to show why our research backs up this truth claim. We love to say, ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the new and improved iPhone 39, right? Or whatever it is. If you're a foodie, right? You like your plate presented. Brianna loves all the cooking shows, man. You know? <clears throat> where, where you can't just slop the food down on the plate. You, you plate it. Present it. You get the white, the white canvas fancy looking modern bowl thing. You can't even tell if it's a plate or not but they're putting food on it, right? They just slash that big streak of orange mystery sauce and sprinkle the garnishes of, you know, what are they, microgreens, and you don't even know if these are edible, but they're like, whoa, you know. Beautiful. Present. We can also present ourselves. And it's interesting whether we realize it or not, based on our dress or our mannerisms, our behavior, our speech, our conduct, every single person in our life makes some kind of judgment about the way that we present ourselves. Some of us worry about this kind of thing way too much. Others of us maybe need to care a little bit more about how we present ourselves sometimes, humanly speaking. Because how we present ourselves implies our identity. When I first started pastoring, I felt like I had to wear a suit and tie every Sunday or I wasn't a pastor. There was something ingrained in what, whether it was right or wrong. I don't wear a suit and tie every Sunday now, right? Praise the Lord. Just picking. Um, it doesn't matter. It, and I had to learn that, right? Because I, I thought that this was a part of my identity now. I had to look this way or I wouldn't be this way. On the other hand, I recently heard a story of a teenager who had every facial piercing you could think of, right? And when asked, what, why? What, what's the deal with all that? 
He said, this is my identity. This is just who I am. Right? The way that we present ourselves implies our perceived identity. I think Paul understood this concept as well. In Romans 6, he uses this phrase, present, three times. He says, present your members. Speaking of the members of your body, your body parts. Present your members, not as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life. Use your members, your body parts, for righteousness. Present them for righteousness. He goes on in verse 16, he says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, meaning slaves to sin, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. And then 2 Timothy, Paul also exhorts Timothy to present himself. He says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. All this to say, presenting our, ourselves is closely connected to our perceived identity. And Paul doesn't just say present yourself here. He says present your bodies. And he's not suggesting some outward appearance. He's not talking about suit and tie. He's not talking about what you wear. This gets down to the skin, your actual physical body. And here's the thing. We Christians tend to think this way. Body bad, soul good. Right? Body bad, soul good. That's a lie. That's why we read those scriptures about how God formed us and made us and is glorified through our bodies. Of course, the body is the thing that, man, if it weren't for this body, I wouldn't deal with sin, which isn't necessarily true. But we feel that way, right? And we say, oh, this body, it hurts. It gets old. It gets wrinkly. You know, it hurts. If it weren't for this body, everything would be better. I want to shed this skin. I want to be a happy soul the rest of my days. And again, the only problem here is the Bible. Because God created us with a body. He intends to sanctify that body. And then he has plans to glorify our bodies for all of eternity. We are physical creations. And the new heavens and the new earth will be a physical place with physical bodies. Do you know that? We're not just being like, you know, floaty souls. Like, like that's, that's not the end goal here. We're people. We're humans. That's how God made us. And maybe you don't have like the body soul problem. Maybe you have more of a body image problem. Because you, you see the Kardashians... You see the models on, on TV and the commercials and celebrities and, and, you know, the teeth whitener commercials. And you're like, man, something's wrong with me because <laughs> I got coffee stained teeth, man. You know, if our bodies don't look like those bodies, something must be wrong with me. And thus we develop all kinds of problems revolving around self-worth, diet culture, or we have severe issues even among the body of Christ, anorexia. Bulimia, severe body image issues. And all the while, God's word is crying out to us. Your body is mine. It's mine. I made it. It's mine. I love it. I'm sanctifying it. I'm going to glorify it. Young ladies in the room. Young moms in the room. Old bodies in the room. Hear this truth. God made your body. God calls it good. Don't call what God made evil. And don't let anybody else tell you what to think of your skin besides the one who made it. That's kind of a sidetrack. This is going to make a little bit more sense if we read what he's telling us to do with our bodies. 
What is he telling us to do? Present your bodies as a what? A living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. So here, here you take your body, you present it, you put it forward, you reveal it, and the identity that you show it with is attached to your body. You're, you're commanded by God to show your body as a, as a living sacrifice. That's the prescribed identity of your body. Now, if we read that at first glance, living sacrifice, does the Lord want us to, to die? Is that what he's saying? We see the living sacrifice of the Old Testament, right? They take the, the lamb, they slit his throat, you know, the blood, they put it on the altar, sprinkle it like, is, this, is God calling us to be, a, be martyrs everywhere? And there will be martyrs. God calls some to be martyrs. But I don't believe that's what he's saying here. This is really a beautiful um, irony that Paul is, is writing. Because the Lamb of God has already died as the final, once and for all, living sacrifice, right? Jesus already did that with his body. And since he died, and since God has accepted his sacrifice, and his wrath has been fully satisfied, now we take our living bodies that he brushed off with his righteousness and put a new robe on, and cause us now to present these bodies that he's making over, as a living, alive sacrifice. Our bodies have been made alive through his death and his body. Which means every physical thing we do now must be a testament to our transformation and thus a sacrifice at the altar of the living God. Paul did not command outward expression or external beauties to adorn our body with. The implication here is that our bodies are already beautified through the grace and the mercy that was given that transforms us. And our bodies are being sanctified through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that now lives in us as a temple. So practically, what does this mean? Well, all the good Southern Baptist preachers say it means you don't have sex it means you don't do drugs and you don't get drunk. Amen. No gospel. Go home. <laughs> kind of a joke, but not really, right? This is related to behavior. We are to be led by the Spirit, not by flesh. But this is a command to do something. Not stop doing something. Do something. Do. Active. Participate with your body. Sacrifice your body. The sacrifices that our living bodies give to God are the physical activities that we produce which are described by God then as holy and acceptable to Him. He's saying use your God-given body for holiness. Use your God-given body for what God calls acceptable. Because remember, who's in control? He sets the standard of what's acceptable. He gave us mercy. He allows us now to use that mercy to, to live holy lives with our bodies and do it by the mercies of God through Jesus. I think there are two more texts that really help us understand what he's saying here. We already read the first one. That was Romans 6. Don't present your members, right, as uh, uh, opportunities for sin or unrighteousness. Present them rather as a means of righteousness. Now he's saying the whole body all the members, all the body parts. No part of your body is out of the equation. All of it must die to sin and live to righteousness. Hebrews 13 is the other text I want to mention to you. You might even want to flip there. <clears throat> We're almost done, I promise. Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13. The author of Hebrews is now getting sort of to the end and all the, of, of all the claims he's made and sort of more application and, and, and living out all these wonderful truths. In chapter 13, starting in verse 15, pay attention to the words here. Chapter 13, verse 15. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a what? Sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of what? 
lips that acknowledge his name. Verse 16, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such what? Sacrifices are pleasing. Another word for acceptable to God. The word sacrifice is used twice here. And it's not talking about anything metaphysical or hyper-spiritual. It's talking about lips that, that, do, that sing, that talk, that acknowledge His name. Use your body, your lips. And it's talking about good deeds things you do with your hands, places you go, what you do with your body, do good things with it. And it's talking about giving your stuff away. Because the kind of use of your body that pleases God is the kind that's holy and acceptable and physically visible. Right? That's what we're talking about here. The physically visible display of your body that has been transformed by God and His mercy. How is the fruit of your lips? That's the application of sacrificing your body. What do you do with your mouth? Right? Is your mouth literally used for God's glory? And, and when you use your mouth, is it a visible display that God's mercy is dwelling in that person? How about your hands? What are the fruit of your hands? Do you do good? Do you apply yourself to good and worthwhile endeavors? Or do you just waste your body with trivial nothingness along your days? Or do you do do something? Do you work faithfully in your job where God has assigned you and tasked you to be? Whether it's spreadsheets or digging holes and hammers, Whatever it is, are you, are you faithful to God? And do people see you using your hands and your feet and the places you go and the things that you do as a visible display of God's mercy? And do you care for others? Do you care for your family as God would have you to care for your family? Your wife, your husband, your children, distant relatives, siblings, parents? Do you care for them? Do you live generously among men? Not hoarding God's gifts for yourselves, but giving freely wherever there is a need. Listen, the fruit of a body that has experienced the transformative mercy of God is one that continually lends mercy. Continually gives. Because how, how have our bodies been transformed? Through mercy, according to mercy. So now one of the most just potent, visible displays of the use of our bodies is when we take what we have and we give it away. Right? That says God's mercy is there. God's mercy is being used with that body. This is worship. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. This church exists to help you give your body to God. We want to see the transformative power of the Holy Spirit grow you into a vessel that uses every single property of your physical nature in a God-glorifying manner. Because based on Romans 12, there was a time where this wasn't happening. We were using our bodies in ways that were not holy and not acceptable to God. But now through the mercy of God and through the sacrifice of Christ, our bodies are being redeemed. And sometimes we still do use our bodies in unholy ways, right? Yeah, but he is redeeming us and he's making us to use our bodies the way they were created to be used. So think personally and privately for a minute. What parts of your body do you need to crucify? The eyes, the things that you look at, the hands and how you use them for good or for evil the feet and the places you go and where you take your body and how you spend your time and energy, your ears and the things that you listen to. Does the input into your brain through your ears produce holy living? Jesus said that it would be better to cut one of these things off 
if it causes you to sin, because it'd be better to go to heaven with one eye than to go to hell with both, right? But then what did Jesus do? His body was forsaken for us. His body was cut off. His body was wounded. He died our death. His body was crushed for us, so we don't have to cut anything off. He lives in a glorified body, sanctifying us to use our bodies for spiritual good and fruitful living. What is he sanctifying now? You don't have to cut it off. Let him change you. Secondly, how are we collectively using our bodies for God's glory at Main Street Baptist Church? We come together as a people with bodies. Have you ever thought about how weird it would be if we came here and we didn't have bodies? How would we express anything? How would we hug one another? How would we sing without lips? How would we pray? How, how, would, how would we do any of the things we do? How would we take food to somebody's house that's got COVID? How, how would we babysit for tired parents? How would we say yes to service opportunities like being in the sound booth or ministering to children or helping teaching or a, a variety of things? How would we say yes if we have no body? God's given us a body. So you might use it. You might say yes, and you might give it away here at Main Street Baptist Church. The world looks at us doing all of these things with our physical bodies, and it has no explanation. We are a church that is transformed by the gospel, lives by faith, and is known by our love. Jesus has done this. How did Jesus do it? Jesus did it with his body. Jesus bore our sins in his body. By his wounds, we've been healed. The Father gave the Son a physical human body so that three things could happen. All of our sin would be transferred to that body. That body would die and be crushed under the weight of God's wrath. And that body would be physically resurrected by the power of God and one day return in glory and power. And so now... 2 Corinthians 4 says that we are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. We ain't even scratched the surface, but this is worship. This is worship. This is how we worship with our bodies. Uh, if the Lord gives us next week, we'll talk more about this. Until then, hear God's word. Do you not know? Do you not know? That your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, for speaking to us transforming us. Help us to see more and more of what true, spiritual, pleasing, acceptable worship looks like in the body of Christ over the next several weeks. We give our bodies to you. They are not our own. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.